Um, although we're still talking policy, <laughs> which is perhaps not as exciting as the hip hop dancing this morning, we've got <laughs> Anushka's bringing around some, um, some materials for you this afternoon. There's a handout which has as a guide for you and a reference point the SDGs the 17 global targets for the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. We don't need to introduce what they are because I'm assuming everyone in this room already knows what they are now. <laughs> it's time for us to move forward and we need to go deeper. Um, so we're not only talking about targets, but we're also going to be in getting down to the indicator level and looking at data sets and monitoring and evaluation over the next days. Um, Today we're going to be looking at the top line policy thematic areas we want to build into the SPARPE action plan for 2019 to 2030. So remember the themes that we've got in, our, in the action plan are also at the bottom of that first page of your handout that talk about policy development and capacity building. It talks about advocacy and communication, regional consultation, coordination and action, monitoring and evaluation, and research and education. Uh, this session we're talking about policy, right? And we're talking about policy in the context of thematic areas that have significance at the regional level. We heard this morning from the sports minister from Fiji about some national issues related to uh, the sport policy of Fiji. And the particular issues for Fiji need to align to the national development priorities of Fiji. In Vanuatu, the new national sport policy has to align to the Vanuatu national development priorities. And they're different. There's a different set and a different number. So we're not talking about national development here. When we're talking about policy in this session, we're looking at areas of regional significance where we can collaborate together with specific actions to drive this agenda forward. And we're talking specific and measurable actions. Over the period of the action plan, which is 2019 to 2030, that gives us three four-year cycles. So the first phase we're looking at is 2019 to 2023. Set. Uh, on the back of that page is something else that's really phenomenal. It is the Global Action Plan for Physical Activity, which we just heard from Dr. Wendy Snowden from WHO, to keep front of mind about the targets and the priorities. And I particularly wanted to draw your attention to the target there in the GAPA, the Global Physical Activity Plan, sorry, Global Action Plan for Physical Activity, which is a 15% reduction in the global prevalence of physical inactivity in, adult, in adults and adolescents by 2030. So in the fine print of that document, they call for a 10% reduction by 2025 and a 15% reduction by 2030. This is an example of a policy imperative which has specific targets and specific actions. This is our task to design for the next few days. It's time to strap in. <laughs> okay, what we do now. We have presented uh, some policy themes already today. So if you see on the cards in front of you, you have a number of thematic areas already mentioned. You'll see physical education. And we heard from Dr. Dean Dudley before on quality physical education and some specific considerations for the Pacific. You heard from Integrity, uh, Damien Voltz from Australia on specific risks and um, specific concerns in the Pacific related to Integrity. We heard from, who else did we hear from? Wendy Snowden, Dr. Wendy Snowden on health and physical activity links to international policy frameworks and conventions, including the uh, Global Action Plan for Physical Activity, which we're gonna refer to from this point on as the GAPA. Is everybody okay with that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we heard about the Macklin Convention, which is the, uh, the international framework as it relates to um, m m the manipulation of sports competition. Um, there's two things that we haven't discussed yet, which are on the, your lists. One of those is climate action and sustainability. And I'm bringing apologies from Anthony Taluli from SPREP. 
um, the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program. So SPREP are a member of the regional task force that was formed in April. Um, they're a firm believer in the value that sport brings to the climate action and sustainability agenda in the Pacific. They have... They have... Um, undertaken an initiative uh, of greening the games this year in conjunction with the 2019 Pacific Games in Samoa, uh, with a whole number of initiatives embedded in that. And they've got forward planning to embed climate action in a big way um, across the Pacific. There are, is alignment in terms of climate action and sustainability to specific SDGs, like life below water, life on land, uh, there's, there's a specific set which we can document and map out in our policy agenda. And there are a few key actions that they've asked us to highlight and incorporate in our planning today around policy guidance for countries um, and for Pacific stakeholders on sport, climate action and sustainability. There is a UN uh, framework on sport and climate action. The IOC has a sport and environment program that's very extensive. The language of that, we need to also merge with the Pacific language that relates to climate action, oceans, environment and sustainability. Now it's time to get into the nitty gritty of the policy language, the wording, how we're going to frame things and how we're going to agree on the context to make this relevant and specific for the Pacific. Uh, that was just a few points on climate action. There are a number of stakeholders here in the room that are passionate climate activists and sustainability fans who will love the reusable water bottles that we have given everybody today. Hands up all the climate action fans. <laughs> That's half a hand from Maria. <laughs> Torn between disability and climate action. It's okay, you can still represent Pacific Disability Forum. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we were also supposed to have this afternoon representation from Chitra, Chitra Lekha uh, Massey from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, unfortunately, she's ill today, but she'll join us either tomorrow or the next day. And uh, they're her colleague in... Um, her Office for Human Rights, looking after the Pacific, um, is today in Geneva, and we'll be together talking um, human rights at the Sporting Chance Forum in a couple of weeks. We've also done a number of consultations in Fiji, a roundtable on a stakeholder forum here at USP, uh, a roundtable meeting at the UN Office of uh, human rights, and we also attended a Fasanok athlete safeguarding workshop that was hosted within the last month, just bringing to light the connection and the intersection between sport and human rights. We just wanted to make absolutely clear that sport is um, a fundamental human right, not an optional extra for people once they've had all their other um, primary needs met. Um, there is, in reference to the Kazan Action Plan, which is also on your handout, um, human rights language is embedded in the Kazan Action Plan and in the SDG uh, framework. Under Kazan Action Plan follow-up framework, there are five um, actions. The first one of those, key action area one, is where there is an international approach and a collaborative effort to strengthen human rights reporting as it relates to sport. So for human rights reporting, there's two streams. One is the um, UPR, which is the Universal uh, Periodical Reviews, and the other is the SDG VNR process, which is Voluntary National Reviews. So for the UPR, that's in reference to three human rights conventions that member states sign up to. That includes the CEDAW on the rights of women, the CRC on the rights of children, and the CRPD, which Maria is a very big fan of, coming from the Pacific Disability Forum, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability. So when it comes to human rights reporting, there is a, a schedule where member states need and have obligations once they sign and ratify those conventions that they need to report um, against those. What's been missing is the voice of sport in those national development 
um, reporting frameworks. So there is a move to build capacity of the sporting stakeholders to look at who would be involved, what type of data and information should be reported, when should that be reported. Um, we know that sport is, let me just clarify here, sport is in itself neutral. It's not positive and it's not negative. So any safeguards and protections, uh, it's, sport can be a place where, like we heard from Damien, it's open to manipulation. Uh, but there are a lot of areas where people need to be protected and safeguarded, um, including children, including women and other vulnerable groups. And we not only need to use sport to advocate against that, but we also need to protect people who are at risk of harm and who have experienced harm. Um, so human rights is something that we need to embed firmly in our actions going forward for all of those reasons. Um, and also that climate action, however we end up wording it. In front of you, you have some thematic areas that with discussion with regional stakeholders so far, we believe they should be proposed as areas of regional significance to be included in our action plan. That means, for example, under the area of policy, we might produce some policy guidance around integrity. We might produce some policy guidelines around child safeguarding. We might have a specific set of actions around human rights. We might have a specific set of actions around integrity. Um, and there'll be something different around climate action. I forgot, is high performance on there? Yeah, excellent. <laughs> okay, there's already a proposition that that needs the word sports included next to it. Now it's time for us to debate. So, <laughs> and this is important, the language is important, the words are important. How we frame these as policy areas need to align appropriately up the line to the international frameworks and conventions and they need to line up horizontally with the other regional structures. For example, the PACREF, Pacific Education Framework. And I think there's a few people in the room that have got visibility and, and are engaged in those regional frameworks, um, as well as those international structures. And we can't forget national development priorities along the way. Um, okay, so you've got two blank pieces of paper there as well. So on your tables, we'd like you to, if in your debates, you think that there needs to be something else added to this agenda as an area, a policy area of regional significance. Um, you've got some more space to add. Uh, if you'd like to rename something, you can do that. We're gonna have a vote and a voting system here. So you've got an envelope and inside it is 20 shells. We're gonna do an activity which is an adaptation of the World Bank's 10 seeds method adapted for the Pacific, so we're using shells. They might be from China. <laughs> Globalization. And um, <laughs> so you've got, your, you've got your 20 shells, and these are your voting tokens. So think of them like resources, not necessarily money, but you've got 20 of these things, and your task is to allocate them um, like, for example, you're not allowed to put all of them in one policy area. I think that's the only rule. You're also not allowed to add any other voting tokens beside the shells. That has happened before. <laughs> so, for example, you might say high performance will give that six shells, climate action will give that three, integrity will give that one, and Damien will come and visit you later. <laughs> <laughs> in areas of regional significance where you think that our sport, physical activity and physical education action plan should be focusing its resources and its investment and where do we need policy? Where do we need policy development and capacity building? That's our heading for this afternoon, policy development and capacity building. So um, when we looked at our sheet, we looked at what we're what were key priorities? And we realised that physical education along with activity was encumbersome. So I've got two arrows, so it's a 360 event. It's not just a partial. Within that 360 event is creating an environment and a community that's safe for all. And so these picks into the values of integrity, high performance, human rights, 
And for this to work, it's actually about asking ourselves about accessibility, acceptance, and inclusivity for all. Amen, that's us. Uh, and then of course I got cheeky and just went, all will be achieved by 2030. So these two blank spots here is for what the next version looks like after 2030. Some of your new suggestions don't have shells. What do, what's the significance of that? That means no resources? And our two blanks, we did recognize that uh, youth, uh, gender, and uh, the inclusion of people with disability was there, but we also named it under the two shells, inclusiveness. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the, the strong rationale that's coming up here, there's a, there's a top tier and a second tier, and a lot of creativity wrapped up in a very strong rationale um, and a policy framework. We can tell that this table does a bit of policy writing already. <laughs> no protests, no protests or appeals will be entered into. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me uh, just, uh, have a clean sheet here. Uh, high level. We thought that uh, we give priority to uh, health and physical activity, bedding down NCDs, you know, uh, physical activity at the young age. If you don't get fit, you're not healthy, forget about the rest. Okay. And again, this has a strong um, correlation with the physical education. We thought that we'll give some weighting also, um, three shells to that, and uh, high performance, okay? To have that, to be able to uh, have decent work and employment, you need to fulfill this, and also the high performance to be able to get a decent work. Now, to be able to also have a decent work, there has to be some kind of trust factor. There has to be a lot of integrity in the activity that you do, okay? And uh, human rights, talking about uh, inclusiveness and uh, gender issues, we've covered that under human rights, okay? So we didn't want to complicate that uh, any further. <laughs> and uh, of course, we had that, we thought of trying to put some more, some more um, priorities in there, but we'll save that for the last. Maybe we still think about it, but for us, this is important, and for climate action and sustainability, there is a strong link to all these other priority areas, but uh, that is an area that we still need to uh, put some thoughts and develop in terms of uh, making you know, strong um, um, advocacy or strong policy development uh, around the, uh, and making connect connections to climate change and sports. Of course, yes, it's important, but new space and new area to work on. Thank you. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Questions, comments, concerns? If SPREP were in the house, there'd be a riot. What's that? If the uh, Secretariat for the Regional Environment Program were in the house. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There would, <laughs> there would be a serious challenge that, that, there. That could be here. That's why we've saved that. <laughs> really? No fight? That's the reserve. No You've got to have a reserve list. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Oh, this audience is too easy. More biscuits. Oh, thank you. More biscuits in the tea break. Okay, so in essence, you've made one clear decision, which is health and physical activity gets one extra than everything else. <coughs> so you've got a large middle section, <coughs> one higher priority and one lower priority. Sure. That's how we're putting our eggs in different baskets. Interesting and very different rationale from the first group. Not better, not worse, just very different and well supported with the rationale. Okay, let's see what we've got next. Okay. Um in our team, we... In our team, that we're not biased and we're not racial, but, um, but we believe that inclusivity and community resilience plays an important part in all of these aspects. But in looking at that, physical education is important. 
I, we thought that four shells is a representation of how important that is into the schools, in the community, and um, and it's a um, it's it, it's a way to promote the health and well-being with the community as well. As you look at the um, um, climate action and sustainability, you know it also involves about like what I said before. It's inclusive, uh, plays an important part in all this diversity and. Um, and the ways in which communities, uh, as mentioned earlier on, um, should come together and work together. Um, also with the health and physical activity, is tackling all the NCDs, as we heard one of the um, permanent secretaries spoke about it. And, um, and it's a, it's a, it's, what's that? Okay. So all these are important part of our health and well-being. So it needs to be looked at. It needs to be um, addressed in the policy. And, and so in order to become, we also need to have human rights, having the ability to accept other cultural background and, um, and within the organization that we're working with. Yeah, inclusive participation as well. So, um, okay, any questions for us? Because we, 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 we think it's, it's a policy, it's a holistic. <laughs> when you're looking at holistic, we're involving different, different things. I have to put my mouth in here. So I won't say which country I, I come from, <clears throat> but we have played, and it's been, re it's been really shameful, we have played matches with other people in the world without integrity. And that's when I want to put a paper bag over my head and sort of slink away, and I don't want to be associated with that country, even though I hold the passport and the nationality. So integrity, I think, is really important because it's the bedrock of society. If you can't do things with integrity, what's the point? So it, it scores really high for us. And high performance, not everyone will be an elite athlete, but for those who break through the barriers and can become a, an elite athlete, then that's fantastic and we need to support them. Um, so in all, it's about everyone having a human right to participate in society to the fullest, to be the best that they can be. And certainly if we're talking about sport, health and well-being and physical activity, that comes with sustainability. It's not a, it's a given because you can't be sustainable by sitting cutely on your little sofa. You have to go out there and be active and take part, be an active citizen. So that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. According to it's an important part of the challenge of the uh, or on the oh. According to <laughs> Sustainable Development Goal number four, it talks about inclusive education and quality education. Mm -hmm. And, and um, we need to look at those, um, what's equity, what's, um, um, what's the word? Well, you, you need to know, is it access? You need to have access and you need to be able, it's like what Leslie said this morning. It's looking, it's not just looking at the policies, but just if you think of people as people and you think how can we include people so that they can be part of our community because this is about community building. Unless we can do that, then what's the point? When you're chosen few, will have access. Absolutely. Leave you. no one behind. Okay, interestingly, you've got no, <laughs> your top line, you've got four each for health and physical activity and physical education. So you're calling it an even tie between SDG 3 and SDG 4. Yes? <laughs> okay, you're blending 
physical activity and physical education into the one. Nice. Hold on. Uh, thank you. We'll uh, just start with this uh, rationales that we have here. Uh, our group believe that the thematic areas that are being put forward, proposed by the region is fine. Uh, however, the activities that uh, individual countries will be working on, that will be quite a challenge. So uh, we felt that uh, the number one day is health and physical activity uh, because we would like to start from uh, uh, early education and secondly, from the physical education. And the third one is uh, high performance uh, sports. Uh, without the uh, two, uh, the first one and the second one, uh, we would not be able to get the uh, intended results for high performance in sports. And you might uh, also see that we have uh, noted the word sports there because you can have high performance, but high performance in what? So we thought that we specifically would like to put the word sports there. Uh, instead of just high performance itself. Uh, sport integrity is quite a new word for us. We would also like to add uh, the word governance there. Uh, and uh, it's basically honesty. It will be a big thing uh, in the near future for the region. Um, we have the human rights. It's uh, not only one shell, but uh, it means a lot in the region, uh, just because we run out of shells. So <laughs> don't take us wrong for that. Uh, also climate action and sustainability. Um, we would like to add in another thematic area, which is education uh, and entrepreneurship. So uh, something uh, in which Tibet can uh, be used in the region to uh, promote the other high education levels uh, in terms of sports. My colleagues may want to highlight further what are the other diagrams uh, at the bottom, the connectedness uh, diagram. Uh, yeah, I think in summary, what we discussed was there's there's a connection in every, for this particular one, the three. There's a connection in it and we need to coordinate ourselves so that mm -hmm. it produces the outcome. As mentioned earlier, that it's a holistic development for, for a human being. And, um, yeah, and I think for this one here, what we said was the entrepreneurship for this to work and be sustainable. We have to be creative in how we develop new stuff. It's about being a creative entrepreneurship so that we start to create and address the needs in our communities. Awesome. Nice. Thank you. Nice. Originally, we were looking at things to add and gender equality and inclusion were the two things that sprang to mind. Uh, but then we really started to group them. We said, well, aren't they human rights? Um, so we've grouped them together. We thought health and physical activity and physical education go hand in hand. Um, so we grouped them together and then we also had a few on climate action and sustainability. Uh, you'll notice, sorry to those people, uh, integrity and high performance, we didn't put any shells on. And for us it was really about what we prioritise in terms of sustainable develop, development goals and that's more the benefit to the most amount of people. Um, so we really focus on those, I guess, the bottom of the pyramid participation at that level. Anything else to add? I just going to say, because uh, on the climate action side of things, one of the key elements that goes hand in hand with active transport is awareness of physical activity and the lifestyle uh, decisions that are uh, basically people are made aware of by virtue of physical education, understanding why it's important to mainstream that through your entire life and how you incorporate that into your active transport has those, those co-benefits in, uh, in terms of climate action. Am I understanding correctly that you don't value the rights, participation and empowerment of youth in the Pacific? Is that part of the inclusion? Is it? I think so. <laughs> So we've got youth, we've got gender, we've got disability. These are all cross-cutting themes across all of the SDG agenda. So and we've got some policy choices to make here about how we're going to incorporate these um, in our framework. Awesome. I will say while you're talking about youth, we talk about uh, ex 
extending uh, livelihoods and, or, sorry, uh, lifespan and, and keeping the elderly active as well and how that ex extends their lifespan. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's important. Nice rebuttal. Yeah. Nice rebuttal. <laughs> Nice rebuttal. Okay, this team also gets points because if you notice, the way that they've aligned their three pillars there, they also match up to the Kazan Action Plan three pillars. So if you hold that one up again, one of them very clearly links to inclusivity, inclusive and comprehensive access for everyone, which is thematic area number one. The middle bit there connects to the SDGs very clearly, which is number two. And then the third one's around integrity of sport. Um, which, which captures that third category. So there's a bit of super genius going on behind the scenes over there. Although I do notice in merging those together that you've not actually made a decision between those areas, which is quite creative. <laughs> <laughs> it's a balanced review from over here. No, nice effort. And again, very, very different, a very different approach than what's been tabled before. Very, very diverse. Who's next? Okay. Okay, uh, I think we'll start with uh, one that we added, entrepreneurship. Um, I think it's important to note that we should be considering life after sports and career transition. And when we're doing player development and sport development, how are we uh, bringing in career skills and life development with that? Entrepreneurship could also be looking towards um, athletes as role models to promote green business. So how do we take the athlete's role model status and how do we promote things like health, like NCDs? Uh, health and NCDs is related to the climate action and trying to promote uh, traditional crops that are both good for the health but also good for the resilient climate. That ties into human rights. Uh, food security is a human right. So how do we use athletes' entrepreneurship skills to promote a green business that brings in food security, uh, traditional diets, in traditional farming. Um, we also included the disabilities and special needs as well. Uh, we were really motivated by Leslie's speech this morning. Um, and then of course you have the integrity underneath it all. I think that's just kind of the, the common ground underneath it all, eh? And uh, yeah, any questions? <laughs> so your top three, you've got four each. Four, integrity, climate action and sustainability. Yes. Health and physical activity. And then you've got a second tier, which is very clearly physical education, which you're thinking is underpinning that. And then a third tier with your third level of priorities, which are all one or two. That's uh, I wouldn't call it a third tier. I would call it we ran out of shells. <laughs> but they're all very important. <laughs> OK, awesome. Any other questions, comments, challenges? Integrity are very quiet. <laughs> okay, so we started off with uh, 18 and a half shells and we expanded on that. <laughs> um, we took this a bit literally and, uh, sorry, so our areas of uh, real focus um, with the shells falling off, uh, physical education, um, healthy, health and physical activity, we took that as a basis that we all need to do healthy activity to stay healthy. Then we looked at uh, physical education as a basis for sports performance and looking at high performance to get that uh, interest in. Um, we did put a lot of emphasis on climate change and sports tourism because there's opportunities there for us to explore. Uh, as well as in terms of human rights and integrity, we also talked about uh, gender equality and the importance of that, bringing that into sport. Uh, we also saw this space as really important in terms of uh, building entrepreneurship. There's been talk about uh, employment and um, life after sports, but also the opportunities that um, this provides for small and medium enterprises. Uh, if you look at <coughs> Fiji, our 20% export in the Pacific is human resource rugby players. So a uh, really good example is uh, Sir Mayambai and what he's doing with his program. He's exporting rugby players from Fiji. And he's linking with uh, New Zealand, Japan. He's using his contacts he made in Europe. That's life after sport, but also an SME that's developing in a space that's being created because of the interest in the sport. Um, so that's the action that we took. 
In terms of um, climate action, there's a whole lot of uh, information and activity in there that relates to and brings us back to sports tourism. And it's really important because the footprint from all our sporting activities is quite big. Uh, not just the one day or two day sport event, but people coming in in terms of accommodation, travel and everything. And if we include climate activity throughout our development, then people will know that they need to be um, conscious of their footprint, of the uh, type of activity that they do in terms of walking two minutes to the venue or taking a cab, uh, or the type of um, things that they use during meetings, for example, water bottles or single-use plastic. Thank you. Nice. Questions, comments, concerns? I've got a couple of curveballs for you. Uh, there was no mention from anybody on facilities, infrastructure, and safe spaces for sport. Question for the crowd. Do we believe in this? <laughs> Community and environment safety. Do you mean in terms of facilities and infrastructure? That's, that's a warm, fuzzy hug of safety for everybody. for everybody, uh, regardless of age, gender. It's, it's an openness for everyone to actually have some form of physical activity. And of course it evolves when you get through to the high performance end, so that's the whole reason why in drawing that circle 360, everything flows in and out at some point. Okay. I think, um, uh, there was some talk before about sports tourism coming to the table and there was a, a, a push from the table over here to add shells for sports tourism before its income generating possibilities, economic benefits for national governments as part of our argument for why we should be prioritising. Another example for the Solomon Islands in the last week, they've attracted significant resources for sports in infrastructure in hosting the next Pacific Games. I think it's in the order of $80 million for AUD for facilities. Uh, from one government and about three other governments kicking in significant amounts. I will share the actual figures, they're not in my mind right now, but do we believe that facilities and infrastructure should be counted in our strategy or has it, since it hasn't come up yet, do we leave it out? What's the feeling of the group? I feel the facilities will be um, an outcome of this strategy. Because for us to do this physical activity, physical education, and sports, we will have to think about facilities. So at the next level, at the activity level, you think that that's um, one of the prerequisites that you're going to need for improved high performance and improved community safety and participation. Okay. You can't talk about inclusion without facility and access. So it just goes without saying, it just comes under that umbrella. Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to accessibility, access to all, uh, under the, um, one of the preconditions for inclusion is accessibility. And uh, when we're looking at accessibility, we're looking also at um, reasonable accommodation. Absolutely. And under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, one of those articles under 30.5 is specifically about access to facilities. So that's embedded in the human rights framework as well. Um, one other thing that's not... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Can I just add to the accessibility and the uh, discussion around facilities is that when we do develop this later on, it has to be, if you want to hold high performance events here, it has to be accredited to international standard. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that we're able to use it for international competition. Uh, we can have uh, accessible venues, but they can also be non-compliant within international standards. Excellent. So we're talking about facilities that are um, available for all ages, all abilities, um, and not only in regional and metropolitan kind of areas, but um, decentralized as well. 
very, very important. Um, something else that didn't come up in those blank pieces of paper, and just a couple of examples, and um, I know that we don't want to copy and paste what Australia and New Zealand have done, but interestingly, both of those countries have uh, national policies and national strategies, one for high performance and another for participation. Do we want to consider, or is it considered already in our language, about participation in sport? Uh, how does it fit in here? Because we haven't spelled out participation and pathways, integrity, governance. This is a question. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, first one, the one on uh, participation. Um, um, I'd like to support that if, uh, uh, going ahead of today and tomorrow. I, I make a comment and link to uh, Dean's um, presentation earlier about uh, literacy and the long-term athlete development model um, where talent identification and talent selection can be a high risk for sports development. And then I think having that... Um, that participation, whatever that model is, to link to high performance at a, at a latter stage of athlete development is critical. Um, just comments on, um, in terms of facility and sports tourism. Um, I think this morning we heard from people f uh, with disability in terms of appropriate facilities, not only for sports activities, but as we know in the Pacific, um, there's a lot of use, possibly more than sports users of general community, church use, that use a lot of uh, sports facilities for um, dedications um, right throughout the year. So there's, there's a mix of return there. There's um, regular use, but also there's a there's a return on investment from multi-users. Um, and, and one question to the group. Um, you talked about, um, to remind, by exporting Fijian rugby players, um, which is fantastic. My, my question is, does the return from that investment dwindle down to the clubs, to their rural clubs and their families? Uh, I would assume the families, yes, but that's a question I'd, I'd, I'd like to pose. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that one simply coming down, the return on investment is uh, coming back to remittances from overseas. It's one of our highest earners as well. And that's direct impact on um, families, but also commitments in the community. For example, church events that they contribute to. Um, and it's rugby players, rugby league players that find that pathway. Mm. Yeah. Just one more comment to add is uh, when we were talking about high performance, we also, I think uh, that table mentioned, not just athletes, but um, administrators, coaches, um, the entourage around ath athletes, so that we're not relying on international officials coming in to run our games for us. Right. Okay, nice. Okay. So on, on that thinking, I was going to suggest before, or I'll raise the question, pose the question, could we adjust the language of that, that um, note on high performance sport and call it sport pathways and participation? Sorry, or sport pathways and high performance? But perhaps there are too many considerations in there and very different stakeholder sets and very different activities required to service those two groups. So something I think we need to flesh out a little bit more in the context of our discussion about regional policy development and capacity building. Um, I think we've captured the entry points with physical education and physical activity. We've captured the high performance, but we're missing the middle servicing that, that whole sports sector um, with all the national federations and all the clubs and all the people that, um, that are participating in that space and what they might need in terms of policy frameworks. Although from our regional activity, um, sorry, from our policy landscape, we may argue that they will be considered and they will be beneficiaries of our policy guidance related to human rights and child protection so we could consider that they've already been captured. What do you think? Do we need to add another sector? Or do we need to weave into our language that we're catering for everybody in that way? Because remember, we're leaving nobody behind. 
The other option is, because the, the terms we're familiar in sport, is the long-term athlete development. And that comprises from when they start active start to when you play for life. So the other option is to just have long-term athlete development because those three fit into that, the stages of development. And so that should cover, the long-term athlete development will cover both these three plus the missing one, which is stages, the one that's here, it's stage one, two, three, and six. The other stages is kind of hanging somewhere. So rather than specifying these three, then you just use the long-term athlete development to encompass the seven stages. Okay. OK, so what I'm hearing is we should leave that out and capture the headings as we have them and, and move forward, which is good. Um, that the long-term athlete development framework's got seven different stages. If we just include that language as it is, then we're going to need to speak to those other four, which may not be speaking directly to the rest of our framework. So if we just take out those bits that reflect the discussion about regional significance in the Pacific, and we can link it together when we do our mapping exercise, and I think that fits really well. And we just make sure that we understand who we're talking to and who we're servicing, and that we're not leaving anybody behind. You see why we're interrogating this and challenging each other? To make sure that our thinking is robust, and we don't shake the tree and all the goodness falls out. I, I think the good thing with this one, because uh from the LTAD, it's for the sport, like for us in sport, but for the target group, we're trying to get them to buy in these ones is probably better. And so that, yeah, from that perspective, it's just really capturing how we're embedding the sport component in here. And okay, awesome. Okay, sorry, that was an important thing to clarify. Is there anyone else that we've left behind? I don't think so. I think we've, we've, um, We've done a pretty phenomenal effort um, this afternoon. What do you mean? Yeah. OK, the next step. <laughs> the next step is our team of experts over there behind the wall of laptops have been madly taking notes all day, capturing the scores, and uh, we'll be computing and analyzing at the research office overnight. And uh, we'll be building on this tomorrow with our sessions tomorrow. And what we're going to do is put all of this together and make sure as we're moving forwards, we will take the next step to prioritize which of these have come through in the number of shells as the top line priorities and make sure that we're adequately reflecting everything else that's been raised today, either by grouping it together or directly reflecting it in our documentation. Is that fair? Sorry. Yeah, just a quick question. Obviously, sport has so much potential, as you can see, by everything that's been thrown around, and a lot of it's mutually reinforcing. So you want people to be active, but then you need a good sport system that can attract and retain, build on human rights, and that's great, but then you need your high-performance pathway to attract people as well. So I think it's all mutually reinforcing. So our action plan or our um, what we're going to produce is going to be so big. But do we have the resources to actually do it all? And, and I think that's the question. Like, we thought high performance integrity are really important. But when we focus down on what we can do and what we think we should prioritise, they didn't get any shells. So I guess. How do we get to that point over these next two days? Because I, I say, yeah, that's great. I'd love to do that. But what, what's most important here? That is exactly our task next. So what we'll do is, is take the scores and the, the shared priorities from everybody in the room today. And we'll have this up on the wall tomorrow morning um, before you get here. So we'll have some of the top line priorities. Then we're going to be looking at specific activities that we can do underneath those headings. And again, that's making some logical choices about what's needed. So for example, a policy guidance note on child safeguarding doesn't ne necessarily need to be um, hugely costly, doesn't involve employing new staff. Uh, it could be done before the end of 2020 and it could have a lasting impact for protecting and promoting the rights of children. So there's, we need to come up with the activities that we specifically 
believe that we can address, and tied to that is which stakeholders are connected to it and who would be engaged and how. So we, we're going to build one step after the other um, to put this framework together. But the very first call is which are the thematic areas that we're including and now we're going to prioritise as a next step what we're keeping in, what we can group together and what we can leave out. Very good call though because it's absolutely resource dependent. Yeah. Uh, which is why I really value the robustness of the discussion today. I think everybody's been at the microphone this afternoon. Uh, and it's been really nice to see such diversity of ideas, such creativity in um, suggestions and approaches, but also a shared value and understanding of the, um, the role that sport, physical activity and physical education can play. And really looking forward to build on this tomorrow. So thank you all for your participation today. Now it's time to get into the, the nitty gritty and um, get into the finer details. We talk a lot about sport and the SDGs, but what does it really mean for the people of the Pacific? It's now this is our chance to change the game. <laughs>